Hey everyone, it's Rob Ryder, uh, December 11th, 2012. I put it on an audio yesterday that I did with Roe, and uh, you know what we had been doing to try to find uh, basically the Court of Chancery to go to equity instead of law. So instead of going to put in a case into the place you normally would with the pre-printed forms that they want you to use, that's the law side of the court. They want to know, you know, how much money you're looking for. What's the damages? Well, in equity, there are no money damages. And we're not looking for money. We're, we're looking for a specific kind of relief. I like to say we're looking for justice. But things like an injunction, uh, a subpoena, uh, specific performance, cancel a contract, things to do with faith, sin, uh, operating in good faith, those are all equitable remedies. Sometimes they're called extraordinary remedies, and you get those through chancery. <coughs> and so, uh, in Michigan, as I'll show this old law I found here in a little bit, it said that uh, um, if the county has a, has a county courthouse, that's where the circuit court shall be. Period. Makes it pretty pretty simple. But the circuit they're talking about is a circuit in a much bigger area than a county. And uh, in Michigan, back before it became a state, it was divided into like four districts. And the judges in those districts wrote a circuit. And then a couple times a year, those same judges got together and they acted like the Supreme Court. You know, to hear appeals from the cases from the four districts a couple times a year. Otherwise, they were just a judge in a district with many counties riding a circuit. And so they have a thing called terms, and these terms are when the circuit court is being held in certain counties. And uh, so the circuit court is always being held somewhere, but not necessarily in your county. And if there's no cases for the lowercase circuit court, then they may not even show up. I, I don't know. But <coughs> based on that, Roe went out and looked. I'm going to try to put this audio on YouTube so that, you know, I don't have to explain the whole thing, but um, I really wanted to show the forms that she had gotten. So, Roe went to her old county courthouse, which she drives by to go to the new county courthouse. And she had been in there before, and in the old county courthouse, there is only, you know, the, the only court in there is probate court. And then there's offices upstairs with the, where the judges have offices upstairs, and we thought, well, maybe we need to give it our petition, we're trying to get to the chancellor, we'll go give it to the secretary of the judge. So that's where she went to. And they said, no, we can't take any papers, you know, we're just uh, the administrative side of things. And so Rose says, well, how do I get into chancery? And they said, well, you need to go down to room 160 to the circuit court. And she walks downstairs and looks above the door, and sure enough, it says circuit court above the door. Plain as day, circuit court. Open the door, it's not a courtroom. It's a clerk's office with a counter and counter trolls. And Roe walked in and said that she would like to submit a petition into Chancery. Um, and the lady pretty much knew what she was talking about. And she reached under the table and gave her this form, which is called the 16th Judicial Circuit New Case Information Sheet. And uh, it's a very simple form. As you can see, the plaintiff, petitioner, defendant, respondent, file stamp. Well... You know, you're the plaintiff petitioner, and somebody's going to be the defendant respondent. <laughs> and then it asks for this case type, subcase type, claim amount, jury. Uh, we'll see in a minute the case type and subcase type come off the back of this form. Because we're not looking for money, there is no claim amount, and we don't want a jury. We're, what we really want to have is a declaratory judgment in our favor. Uh, return date, she didn't have to put anything there. Plaintiff's attorney, she didn't have to put anything there. So she was the first name plaintiff. And because we were doing a petitioner, a petition, we said, well, we're going to cross out and call ourselves petitioner. So she did. Down here, she crossed out defendant and put respondent. And uh, she had four defendants. And these four defendants, respondents, came off of the documents she that she was using for evidence, which is her warranty deed, the sales contract between her and the grantor for the land and real property, 
and the deed of trust or mortgage whatever you would call it which is your unilateral agreement with the bank that's really just a gift because they never gave you any consideration they didn't even sign the contract so uh, between those two items there were four uh, four parties of interest other than Roe and I don't believe that she put the uh, the grantor down on the warranty deed either right but I don't think she had to he'd already said he'd been paid he was he agreed to it he put under notary seal and then recorded in the county that he had been paid and you know he's pretty much done what hadn't happened is we hadn't acknowledged the deed and even after it's acknowledged if you just put it back in the same deeds office it's just on deposit we need to get it to the office the recorder what we want is um, specific performance on the contract when you bought the house you you hired an agent who's supposed to take care of this stuff for you well apparently they haven't completed the contract because nobody told you you had to sign it nobody told you it had to be recorded right they're supposed to be the experts they're not operating in good faith but this was the form that you would put on your own petition that you would make up on your own there's really no preprinted forms this is the one side of it and this is the interesting side so here's the other side and so on the front you were supposed to put a class so here's the classes across the top and as you can see each of these have a line here that has the subclass type and here's law right they're looking for money the, these are law law arbitrations law law medium is law we're not looking for money All right we're looking for justice and uh, but you can see you could do one for tax you could do it all sorts of them now in the middle of the page here we have these miscellaneous remedies these are remedies other than looking for money and uh, we'll pop it up so we can just concentrate on these for a second okay what kind do we have we got judicial reviews a declaratory judgment there it is row 0604 we should have asked for declaratory judgment Corporation Dissolution, Habeas Corpus, Mandamus, Prohibition, Coronto, Escheat, Lost of Goods or Money. I, you know, all these have something to do with asking for something other than damages. Now, the one we decided to use, because we were, wanted to get into Chancery, we put under Chancery, which is CH0714, <laughs> Complaint in Equity. We had an equitable complaint trying to get an equitable remedy. And so we were using the maxims of equity as our um, principles and then adding to those the facts to back them up. You know, such as equity won't suffer a wrong without a remedy. Well, we've been wronged. That should be enough. But we went a little bit deeper. So, you know, this is the form that this, that she got from an office so when you look above it says circuit court when you open the door it's not a courtroom it's a clerk's office and she's sitting here talking to these people across the table figuring out how to do this and then walks uh, an attorney who was uh, she believes the district attorney who was involved in her uh, traffic case last year I and mean, she knows it is I, I shouldn't say she thinks it is she knew it was I don't know if he recognized her or not doesn't matter he was filling out one of these same forms putting in a new case and apparently a couple other suits walked in and they were filling out the same form and so they go to this office to put in their damn paperwork this is the office where the papers you can't find either are or went through first this is the equity side of the court and so I don't know if you can just on a motion ask for the documents you know you want to get your court record for some reason and you go to the law side of the court they're going to give you the law side of the documents 
Law and equity are separate. They may be administered by the same people. They're separate forms of law. In fact, the doorway to, uh, basically, the outer door to heaven, the kingdom of heaven, is what Roe went into when she walked into the sanctuary. Um, that's not even in the same building as were, the, were, as were this 16th Judicial Circuit Court is. But through other investigation, we, we know we knew, or Roe Ro knew, <laughs> and told me, that the clerk of this court, 16th Judicial Circuit, stays at the 16th Judicial Circuit till about noon, and then she makes her runs. And one of the runs is to this office here in Chancery. Picks up the mail. I don't know how many other places she goes, right? But um, So her husband had called this lady, this clerk, when she was at the 16th Judicial Circuit, which is the new courthouse, some time ago asking about the Court of Chancery, and the lady's answer was, there is no Court of Chancery here. And she wasn't lying. So the follow-up question would be, well, then where is the Court of Chancery so I can go there? She didn't deny there was a Court of Chancery. She just said there was no Court of Chancery there. Right? Confession and avoidance. So take it to the next step. Well, if it's not there, where is it? Are you not the clerk? And, you know. Um, and add that one more question. And we learned to ask those second questions by having asked the first one at least to get an idea of what we're going to get. Roe got this paperwork. So what we did where it says case type, we put CH and then 0714, which would be um, complaint and equity. We could have just as easily now, looking at it, put in declaratory judgment. And I think if we had put that, it would have gone immediately to a judge to make a determination. Um, because John, a brother in New Hampshire, took a friend's in uh, on the same day, on Monday, and they had put declaratory judgment on theirs, and the judge didn't give him a declaratory judgment, but he did put a stay in against the uh, uh, the foreclosure proceedings. And when you go look at the word stay, and I don't remember what the definition is, but it's a very interesting definition. Waiting for bonds and so forth to be put in. Right? They've been caught. you got to stay until the 20th of December. <laughs> and... Uh, um, so, on Rose, they ended up saying, uh, on the, the paperwork when it left this office, the Chancery office, it said, would be set for April something, 2013, which is probably the next time the circuit court meets in this particular county. But had we said declaratory judgment, well, they would have held a special um, circuit, or whatever they would do, to have it looked at now. And that's what they did with John's because he asked for a declaratory judgment. Um, they didn't give it to him, but he has a, on December 20th, they have a hearing. And they've asked to see, you know, the attorney's uh, um, contract between the attorney and the plaintiff. Just to make sure that you're actually, you know, you say you're representing these people. Well, I want to see the contract. I don't know who you are. And again, the fact that they've acknowledged the warranty deed. <coughs> And they're asking to have specific performance to have it properly recorded and the title deed put in the hands of the petitioner. The title deed being the piece of paper the title company or somebody has that as long as they have it, the law says they're the legal owner. They're actually your joint tenant. You have equitable title, they have legal title. Well, they shouldn't have any title. They have nothing to do with it. Merely because it's in their drawer, the law says that they're the owner, legally. So your only recourse is to go to equity because you have equitable title. And good equitable title is better than legal title. <coughs> and then the other issue is the deed of trust, on which you're the only signator, makes it a unilateral contract. Uh, they want to call it an agreement. Uh, call it whatever you want. In contracts, unless you both sign, it's not a freaking contract. And so that's the evidence that, that's been submitted. So Roe's going to go in tomorrow and put in a motion on hers asking for declaratory judgment based on the preponderance of the evidence that the record does not reflect, even though she sent 
the bank a letter saying, hey, either sign the deed of trust or, you know, give me back my securities. They haven't responded. <laughs> the deed of trust is still not signed. It's not on the record as being acknowledged by the lender. There is no contract. The bank is not operating in good faith. Well, either that's true or not, right? So we don't need to wait to April. We want to know now. So, uh, okay, so that's that for them. And what else did we talk about there? Then they had these court rules that we talked about a little bit. And uh, this just shows that in uh, 19, uh, or 1999, must have been August, all these judges agreed that a particular rule, 2.17, was going to be used in this court. May also be adopted in DeKalb, Kendall counties upon written order by the presiding judge of that county. So I'm wondering if these three counties, this is Kane County here, if Kane County, DeKalb County, and Kendall County make up a circuit. I don't know. And then, uh, you know, the circuit judges, the 16th Judicial Circuit hereby adopt Rule 2.17. Roe had gone in the second day asking, hey, are there any rules that go with this form? And this is what she gave her. And it talks about the size paper you can use, um, how they should be numbered, so forth and so on. Minimum of 10 point. In Michigan, it's a uh, minimum of 12 point, or font. And then the last one here said... The circuit court shall make available to pro se litigants blank forms in the approved format. Handwritten documents not in the required format will be accepted for filing from pro se litigants only. So if you're pro se, you can handwrite your documents. Now I've had people tell me pro se is not the same as pro per or other words, but when I went and looked, pro se and pro per are the same thing. You know. Those are a level of detail I don't care about. I'm going to equity because that's the chancery, and that's where faith and sin are decided, and I'm bringing God in the courtroom. But we're not going to go in the courtroom. <laughs> she was also told, told, excuse me, by the people in the chancery, because she had a question on the forum, they said, well, we can't give you legal advice. You can fill it out yourself. Or you can go to the library and for five dollars you can hire a lawyer. I had to go check that out. And sure enough, in the law library, they gave her this form. Lawyer in the library. Based on your income, certificate of <coughs> certification of finances. And then up here you would uh, put your name, telephone number, and the type case, which, you know, CH or whatever the numbers were. And Roe asked, well, how does this work? And they said, well, you give us $5. We set up the appointment. You show up, you get your $5 back. You don't, we keep it. You can have three appointments for the same type of case. So you get a half an hour with a lawyer for free, and you can have three appointments, an hour and a half. Right? If you have your ducks in a row, have your petition ready, and know what it is you're going there for. Um, right, a half an hour should be plenty of time. We're just trying to figure out what boxes to check to get this into the chance record. <coughs> so, um, you know, this is Indiana. She found it, right? Walked in the old courthouse, and there it was. Said circuit court above it. Above the door. And they gave her this receipt. Now she did pay. They wanted uh, $278 or something like that, but this is the thing I think of as interesting. On the receipt it says, Seal of the State of Illinois. She got another receipt. Um, when she went to get a copy of her case after it had been entered. Now remember, this isn't in the court building. Somebody came that day, picked up the paperwork, took it over to the court building, entered it as a court case. It's now online. Roe went to get a copy of that, and it doesn't have a seal that says seal the state of Illinois. It has something to do with the 16th Judicial Court on it. 
I'd say this is the great seal of the state. And it's from the Kane County Circuit Clerk. It doesn't say court. Kane County Circuit Clerk. And there's the case number. 212-CH-004405. So those of you playing along at home, you can go file the case. Kane County, Illinois. Court records. 2012-CH-004405. We'll show you what's going on. Complaint and equity. So each of these appear to have a different price cost right and I'm sure there's one that's free but at the end of the day Roe decided to pay it because she just wanted to get it in just fill out the damn form and say you're an indigent man that's for poor people and God loves poor people All right so sign the damn thing okay so that was that form and a receipt number And so basically, <coughs> this was the petition that was uh, put on the back. And unfortunately, we didn't follow the rules necessarily, but, you know, they took it anyways. You know, comes now, petitioner, real full name, last name first, comma, space, first name. That is your real name, as far as they're concerned. For equitable relief in the matter of unjust claims of respondents and others unknown to me concerning ownership rights, title, and interest to certain real and personal property of the petitioner. Equity looks to substance, not form. That would be a maximum of equity. Petitioner is led to believe a stamp tax may be due. This petition has to be seen by a competent tribunal. Ask clerk, of course, to affix any revenue stamps required by procedure if its substance is necessary, because the stamp would be the substance. Your signature could be a substance. Many things could be the substance, right? But if the stamp tax is still invoked and you don't have it on your form, the court isn't going to see your paperwork. However, Roe asked, and she said, no, we'll take care of everything. So, good enough. <laughs> Equity will not suffer wrong without a remedy. Petitioner believes respondent or their agents learned in the law, officers, corporations, bound by solemn oath, may have acted in bad faith. Right? That's my complaint. Equity would not permit a statute to be used as an instrument of fraud. Petitioner believes certain instruments have been have not been lawfully executed as part of a scheme to control the rights, title, and interest of petitioner's land, real property, described on instrument titled warranty deed, yada yada, yada yada. Uh, as may be required by certain statutes to secure petitioner's claim of right. Certified copies of both are included in this petition as evidence. Equity regards done as which ought to which ought out to be done. Oh, right. Bob can't spell. <coughs> Third parties involved as agents have not executed their fiduciary duties as part of the closing of the bona fide sales contract known as the warranty deed to ensure it was properly recorded, transferring the good title into the hands of a petitioner, resulting in a form of joint tenancy between a petitioner and third parties of unknown identity. Petitioner requests the discretion of the court of equity to compel the immediate specific performance and lawful execution of the sales contract known as a warranty deed resulting in good title deed to the land being placed in the petitioner's hands right that's the that's the specific performance we want to have done equity will not assist a volunteer the warranty deed in indicates that the grantor granted and conveyed the land and real property described on its face and said grantor's record Acknowledgement receiving goods and valuable consideration is satisfaction of the sales contract is evidenced by the included warranty deed. Petitioner was compelled by deceit of those learned in law that a loan was required between the petitioner and lender, evidenced by the included mortgage as part of the land purchased by warranty deed, upon which the lender claims to be loaning this petitioner the lender's money. Petitioner is led to believe there is no record recorded bona fide lien for a loan of money. Said mortgage has not been acknowledged by lender or trustee of record, resulting in an unexecuted bilateral agreement <laughs> with which the lender now claims an equitable mortgage over the real and personal property of petitioner's landed estate, her all capital name, 
it was not the petitioner's intention for this to be a gift or an unexecuted use held in trust under control of lender or as a binding unilateral contract. Only one person signs as a unilateral contract. We wanted so basically if there's only one person that signed it then it's an unexecuted bilateral agreement. Therefore I wish to revoke the mortgage and ask injunctive relief by court order to have my securities their conversion and game returned to use of the petitioner. And so they put a couple stamps on when she put this in. Uh, by order of the court, this case hereby set for case management conference before the above named judge, who was not there yet, but he was later. On April 1st, 2013, 9 o'clock. And again, I think that's because that's probably the month that the circuit court sits in this particular county. And then they put this stamp on. Um, that has been since filled out. So, right, when they came from the courthouse where the courts are now, they picked this stuff up, this is the way it looked, took it over there, put it into court, and then filled in the blanks. So that was kind of uh, what happened there. And, uh, okay, so a little background now on uh, some Michigan stuff. <coughs> Most of this comes out of uh, <coughs> a book talking about the uh, um, hmm, compiled laws, that isn't quite the right word, of 1846, revised statutes or something like that. And it talks about all sorts of things, but some of it is about the courts, and, and this was this here had to do with the circuit court. The place of holding the terms of the several circuit courts in each county shall be the courthouse therein, if there be one, and if not, such place within the county as the sheriff and county clerk shall order. The court cannot lawfully be held anywhere uh, elsewhere than the courthouse, except when the county has no courthouse at all. So that was the idea. Okay, it has to be somewhere in the county courthouse. And in the little county next to me, they have a county courthouse, but all the courts are in an annex building down the road. Well, that's not the county courthouse. There's a sign out in front of the county courthouse. says it's the county courthouse. Same with Roe. That's what she found. <coughs> the several circuit courts of the state shall be courts of chancery within and for their respective counties, the powers of which shall be exercised by the circuit judges thereof, and the name and style of such court sitting in the chancery shall be the circuit court for the county of Kent, for me, comma, in chancery. That is the name and style of the court. That's when you do a pleading, that's what the name of the court is. The circuit court for the county of Kent in chancery. When a bill shall be filed in chancery, <laughs> other than for discovery only, the complainant may waive the answer being made on oath of the defendant and in such cases the answer may be made without oath and shall have no other or greater force as evidence than the bill. Alright, this is talking about the declaratory um, what do they call it? Declaratory oath? Go to Bouvier's, go under oaths, there's like 25 different freaking chapters or verses on oaths. <coughs> One's a declaratory oath. In the declaratory oath, it says that somebody has deferred the oath to somebody else, and that somebody else should either take the oath or refer it back. If they don't, the case should be found against them. Well, if somebody's charged you with something, who should take the oath first? The plaintiff. He's deferred it to you. You should either take the oath, purgatory oath, I'm innocent of all charges, I swear to God, or say, well, I'll answer this just as soon as the plaintiff takes an oath. If you don't do that, then your freaking answer has no more weight as evidence than the original bill, which has no weight because it's not under oath. Pretty clear. Right? When you answer, when somebody sends you a summons for an answer, send it back and say, as soon as the plaintiff puts his complaint under oath, I'll be happy to answer him. Until then is, you know, it's a frivolous matter. 
something to that effect. Or, I solemnly swear that I am innocent of all charges. Go in front of a notary, take an oath, and send it back to him. Oath waived, chancery rule. Although an oath is waived, the answer must be signed by the defendant. Right? You don't need to take an oath, but you need to sign it. <laughs> Where the oath is waived, the bill and answer are of equal validity. Zero. Hearsay. Neither outweighs the other. If you want your answer to weigh more than theirs, you either take the oath or send it back to them and tell them to take the oath, and they're not going to take the oath to say that you owe them anything. I thought that was quite interesting. Any person having the actual possession, legal, equitable title, and lands may institute a suit and chancery against any other person setting up a claim thereto in opposition to title claim by the complainant if the complainant shall establish his title to such lands the defendant shall be decreed to release to the complainant all claims thereto and pay cost unless the defendant shall by his answer disclaim all title to such lands and give release to the complainant in which case cost shall be awarded the court may deem just this is saying when the lawyer is coming trying to foreclose on you you can institute a suit and chancery against that case and say well it's I claim the superior rights title and interest to the land property and states mine what's theirs similar to what we did <coughs> uh, the remedy by bill of to quiet title as provided by this section was given to holders of real title only um, Right. The problem with that is they're holding the legal title. Holders the legal title only. They're holding the legal title and their opinion. They got the paper in their drawer with your name on it that gives them a mortgage simply because it's been deposited with them. But it was extended to owners of equitable title also, which is you. And we're trying to get the legal title. This takes a minute for some reason when you cut and paste pictures. Um, there we go. Yeah. There's just more on that. Not really. Remedy independent of statutes. All equitable remedies relating to title to lands existing before the statute are still in force and available independently of irrespective of the question of possession right you always have equitable remedy then they can't get rid of it by statute whenever an injunction shall be applied for to state proceedings at law in an action after judgment or verdict on the grounds that such judgment or verdict was attained by actual fraud the circuit judge or officers granting the injunction shall have power to dispense with deposits of money okay Whenever an injunction shall be applied for to stay proceeding at law in an action after judgment or verdict, or on the grounds that such judgment or verdict was attained by actual fraud, so this is every civil action that you've ever been charged with where it was done by fraud, you can ask for an injunction. These civil cases never close. You were found guilty of something 20 years ago, you're still a defendant. The case is still open. And in Michigan, as long as you're the defendant, you can ask the clerk to issue subpoenas. So my point is, you can go ask for injunctive relief against a, a false imprisonment. And for a just remedy. And leave it up to the judge to give you whatever compensation they feel is adequate. And I know some of you are going to say, well, that doesn't, they're not going to give anything. I don't know that to be true. Right? We're not, we had not been going to the right door. When we put this in through chancery, and it goes through chancery first, as far as I, I'm concerned, the frickin' Pope knows about it. They'd better do the right thing. Whenever it is found or a judge in any corporation against which an information nature quo warranto shall have been filed has, by any misuser, non-user, or surrender, Forfeited its corporate rights, privileges, and franchises, the judgment shall be rendered that such corporation be ousted and altogether excluded from such corporate rights, privileges, and franchises that the said corporation be dissolved. 
can you say your utility company in Michigan in the Constitution it says that a public utility franchise can be no longer than 30 years and it's the franchise comes from municipalities not from the state not from the county from municipalities townships cities villages well as it turns out at least here where I am because I have all the oaths of all the elected and appointed officers of the township not a one of them has taken the oath mandated in the Constitution therefore they're not holding a public office therefore there was nobody for the frickin uh, utility to go back to to renew their um, their franchise and where Tom and Rich live um, the uh, township supervisor has been there for you know almost 30 years himself and you know he's not a registered elector they they don't know anything about this stuff so this has been going on for quite some time so you could apply put in an information in the nature of core warranto against a corporation to see if they have a lawful franchise and if they don't and they're a misuser non-user yada 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 they will dissolve the corporation that one would be fun to work with <laughs> okay to entitle a party to any such discovery he shall present a petition to the court or to any judge on vacation verified by oath uh, upon which the order may be granted by the court of such or such judge for the discovery sought or that the party against whom the same is brought sought show cause why the prayer of such petition should not be granted this has to do with chancery court in the section that was on circuit courts it said that basically the circuit the chancery court had been dissolved and its duties were taken over by the circuit court and yet in this book it's got page after page after page of what happens in a chancery court so even though they say we don't have a court of chancery these are the things that happen in the circuit court when you go to it in chancery <coughs> every such order may be vacated by a judge granting the same or the court upon satisfactory evidence the same ought not to have been granted upon discovery sought being made upon the party required to make the discovery denying on oath the possession or control books papers documents order to be produced because you can subpoena them for the books papers and documents the court shall provide by general rule for the staying of proceedings in any case where such discovery shall have been ordered until such order shall have been complied with or vacated this is what they did with John they they uh, ruled on a stay and uh, giving discovery time until the 20th of December so the attorney who says he's a, now this is for John in New Hampshire the attorney who says he's representing the bank the plaintiff has been asked to produce his contract between the plaintiff and him if he doesn't have one well that's called misrepresentation he's guilty of fraud he's going to jail for 30 days or longer according to Lord Coke send him back to the fleet in any case in case any party refusing or neglecting to obey any such order for discovery within such time as may be deemed reasonable the court may non-suit him or may strike out any plea or notice he may have given or may debar him from any particular defense in relation to which discovery was sought and the power of the court to compel such discovery shall be confined to the remedies therein provided and shall not extend to authorize any other proceedings against the person or property of the part or the party so refusing or neglecting you know summary judgment against him now when Roe did this when when she put hers in she didn't have to do any summons or anything else herself the court did all that she gave her a petition she gave this lady a petition with a cover sheet and 276 bucks and the court is going to notice subpoena summons pick the word all of the defendants so the court knows if they've been summoned or not because they're the ones doing it <laughs> and these are the ones that need to be uh, hand delivered well not necessarily hand delivered certain procedure that must be followed and then uh, 
acknowledged under oath. But you know, this back in the days of old when they walked in and said, Are you so and so? Well, yeah, well, here you've been served. That's what's going to happen. The books, papers, and documents produced under any order made in pursuance of the preceding section shall have the same effect when used by a party requiring them as if produced upon notice according to practice of the court. Okay. Right? Produced under any order. Well, what we're doing now, real soon, is we're going to be ordering to see our closed court rolls under our all of the records for your all cap letter name and your real name, which is your last name, comma. It's your surname coupled with your given name. They said surname first. So put your surname first. And if you look at a passport, certain documents, it has your last name first. Right? I didn't ask me for that to be my real name. Somebody made a judicial determination. That's what it was. All right. Is there anything else on this page? Oh. Well, bear with me. Sorry for all the noise. I've had a bad cough. I got to suck on a cough drop every once in a while. Yeah, it's getting better. I keep telling myself. Okay. Ah, here we go. The people of the state of Michigan enact that an information in the nature of coral warrant may be filed in the several circuit courts of the state. So, in other words, in the circuit court for the county of Kent, comma, in Chancery, that court, <coughs> as well as in the Supreme Court. So you can file it in to either or. Um, and that all provisions of this chapter 100 in this state shall be applicable to such proceedings in circuit courts and all powers conferred upon several judges of the Supreme Court by said chapter are hereby conferred upon judges of the several circuit courts respectively, provided that no such information shall be filed or allowed in any circuit court against any judge of the Supreme Court or any state officer. Well, the people in the township, anybody who's not taking the oath mandated in the Constitution is not a state officer. So, yes, you can put in an information in the form of quo warranto. <coughs> and provided also that no writ or summons issued upon such information shall be served out of the jurisdiction of the court issuing the same. So, they would have to be within the jurisdiction of the court. Okay, all issues joined between parties shall be tried and asserting damages. Okay. Information under this act may be filed by the prosecuting attorney of the proper county on his own relation or that of any citizen of the county without leave of the court or by any citizen of the county by special leave of the court. So as a citizen of the county, you can go in and put in a um, information in the form of quo warranto asking about the franchises of, eh, you know, pick whomever you like. Power company, water company, tax man. All of these are private companies, and we're going to find out if they're not if they're working outside of their charter. <laughs> said circuit courts are hereby authorized to make rules to regulate proceedings of this act and have effect until the Supreme Court shall make rules therefore. Okay. Yeah, that was really this right here. Uh, okay, an information in the form of coron may be filed in the Supreme Court. Either okay, so you can put it in the Supreme Court. When any person shall usurp, oh, I love that word, intrude into or unlawfully hold or excise any public office, civil or military, or any franchise within this state, or any office in any corporation created by the authority of this state, whenever any public officer, civil or military, shall have done or suffer 
an act which by provision of law shall work a forfeiture of his office. When any association or number of persons shall act as corporations within the state without being legally incorporated. Whenever any such information shall be filed, a summons shall be issued thereupon, which shall be served and returned in like manner as a purse, as in personal actions, and whenever the same shall be returned, served, the clerk shall enter the defendant's appearance. And here it says the information for usurping an office, etc., requisites of Lark, L A R K E V Crawford, C R A W F O R D. Looks like 28 Mish 88. People versus Hartwell. 12 Mish 522. People versus River Raisin and L E R R Company. 12 Mish 394.5. So it'd be nice to look at one of those and to see, okay, because they're telling you what uh, the requisites are. The information need not be negative. The respondent's title uh, be the, the information need not negative the respondent's title to office. Not really sure what that means. Burden of proof is on the respondent to justify and maintain his title to the office. Right? Now you get to be the accuser. You just put the burden of proof on them to prove that they haven't uh, that they haven't violated their uh, their charter. Technically any any business doing business in your municipality is supposed to have a license. That's what their charter is. They don't have it. They're not supposed to be there. Okay, we read this. Uh, or upon relation to private party or leave granted against the corporation body whenever the corporation shall offend uh, against any provision of the act or acts creating, altering, or renewing such corporations. Right? Federal corporations whatever they are. If you can find them on Dun & Bradstreet, they're a corporation. Violate the provisions. So many courts where you've, <laughs> many of the courts you've been taken into are just private corporations. You could do coal warranto against them. See if they violated their franchise. You know, all this takes is people writing a piece of paper. Doesn't matter if it's perfect. I don't really care if they accept it. They're going to have to answer it. And that's how we're going to learn what to do next. we got to get them to answer the damn questions. Whenever any defendant, whether a natural or personal corporation, against whom an information in the nature of core warranto shall have been exhibited, shall be found or judged guilty of usurping or intruding into or unlawfully holding or exercising the office, franchise, or privilege, judgment shall be rendered that such defendant be ousted and altogether excluded from such office, franchise, or privilege. And also the attorney general or the realtor, if there be one, recover his cost against such defendant. Coro warranto into the court of chancery is where we need to go. And then just one last thing. This is, uh, you know, so here's how you the trail sometimes starts, right? The state constitution, county clerk. The clerk of each county organized for judicial purposes or other officer performing the duties of such office as provided in the county charter shall be clerk of the circuit court of such county. County clerks are the clerk of the circuit court of such county. It's supposed to be. So then the county clerk of each county or in his absence as deputy shall be the clerk of the Board of Supervisors. So, who's ever sitting as the clerk of the Board of Supervisors is the circuit court, clerk of the circuit court. All right, so who is the one sitting as the secretary for the Board of Supervisors? Circuit court clerks. The county clerk of each county shall be the clerk of the circuit court of the county. All right, Michigan compiled laws is kind of hard to argue with. Although they still tend to. And now here's where, you know, the gray gets in mixed in with the 
black and white. Vacancies in certain county offices, temporary appointment. When at any time there shall be an either of the offices of county clerk or prosecuting attorney, no official or no officer duly authorized to execute the duties thereof, in other words, they haven't taken the prescribed oath in the Constitution, the judge of the circuit court uh, of the circuit in which the county where such vacancy exists shall be situated may appoint some suitable persons to perform the duties either of said officers for the time being. Now, shit, I don't have it readily available. On my certificate of live birth, certified copy of record of birth, it says, I, Stephen Toth, and Stephen Toth was apparently the county clerk, but it's Stephen Toth in all capital letters. That's an assumed name, right? Somebody doing business as. An assumed name, Stephen Toth. What we need to do is go look at the registration of Stephen Toth as an assumed name and see who's actually operating as Stephen Toth. I bet you it's probably the deputy because I don't think these appointed, the elected people really don't have any power. It's the appointed people that have the power. Right? So if they're not duly authorized, so if the county clerk, the elected co county clerk is not duly authorized, in other words, hasn't taken the prescribed oath or some other deficiency that they give them, then the judge is just going to appoint somebody to have those powers. Even though somebody else may be holding the name of the office, they're not holding the power. The deputy is. Some suitable person may be appointed by the county clerk and the prosecuting attorney. You know, this crazy stuff. County clerk. <clears throat> that the county clerk and his surety shall be responsible for the acts of his deputy or deputies and in case of the death, resignation, removal of the clerk or in any case of vacancy and a vacancy is because you haven't taken the prescribed oath that's another one of these Michigan compiled laws <laughs> by any other means <laughs> in the said office of clerk the deputy or deputy shall severally perform all the duties of such clerk until such vacancy shall be filled What's the chances they're not doing that? And I just wanted to show that uh, even in today, in uh, the Michigan Compiled Laws, it shows State of Michigan in the Circuit Court for the County of, in Chancery, it still exists. That is the name of a court. And then we had Judicial Clerks. And I don't think the Judicial Clerk is necessarily the same as the county clerk or the the, the the clerk of the circuit court. I'm quite sure they're not. County clerk office compensation. The county clerk shall keep his or her office at the seat of justice for the county. Right? Well, the seat of justice is the county courthouse. So the county clerk, who is the clerk of the court of record, which is the circuit court without any numbers in front of it just circuit court above the door says circuit court that's what Roe found out walked down to room 160 looked above the door circuit court opened it up not a courtroom but a clerk's room with a counter and counter trolls go figure and it was in the county courthouse And uh, annually, the clerk of each county, immediately after receiving from the township city clerks of his or her county, the names of post office address of the township city officers. <coughs> um, again, the rest were post office addresses. Didn't ask for your street address. This has more to do with uh, trying to become a registered elector and the crazy stuff we were going through, right? If if any of these people are holding at the township level or city level or whatever are actually holding uh, public office, well, the clerk right has their names and post office addresses. <laughs> and.
then finally, uh, county clerks. Each county clerk shall appoint one or more deputies to be approved by the circuit judge. Right, so that's the appointment. One of whom shall be designated in the appointment as the successor to such clerk in case of vacancy from any cause. This is just crazy, right? So I think the elected clerk probably gets to be uh, elected in a clerk for maybe a day or something like that, appoints the secretary, they fall out of the picture. So, anyways, that's what's going on. And uh, um, we'll leave it at that. We'll have more news as we move along. But uh, that's it for today. Y'all have a great day. See ya. Bye.